So welcome. This is uh, going to be a technical webinar, hopefully not too technical, but hopefully uh, technical enough for, for those who showed up. So I'm Dan or Danny Hermes. I like to go by Danny. Uh, I'm a member of developer relations here at Google. Uh, we do things like this. Uh, we, we write documentation. We uh, work on client libraries and we support APIs uh, and you know listen to external developers. Okay, And I support commerce APIs in particular the shopping API. So today we're talking about the content API for shopping. So today we're going to talk about four main things, one of which actually involves code. I didn't want to overload you with code snippets, but it's pretty intense at the end. So the first is uh, we're going to review what's out there, the existing resources. Uh, second, we're going to just review a basic primer of API use for the content API for shopping. Uh, third, we're going to talk about best practices, which actually becomes relevant when you get to the point where you're making requests programmatically. Uh, and using best practices can be a big deal. And fourth, we're going to actually use a client library to manage product data. And I'll say this, uh, when we get to the fourth section, uh, I used Python because this slide deck is actually hosted on Google App Engine and because Python is a dynamic language, but I will be making requests in the slide deck. I will be making real requests to a real account uh, with a real client library. Uh, so if you don't use Python, it may not be of that much utility for you. So you may leave then, or, or you may just zone out and tell questions. But I just wanted everyone uh, to be aware of that. But the first three sections will be uh, language agnostic. So we'll be, we'll be OK up until that point. So let's get started. So first, a review of existing resources. So one thing I want everyone to go look at if they haven't yet is our shiny new documentation. I just uh, just completed a migration of both the Content API and Search API for shopping documentation sets to developers.google.com. Uh, it's our brand new site for all of developer relations, people like me. Um, and they are shiny. You know, We were on code.google.com for documentation for many years. And now we're on developers.google.com, and it's it's really awesome. Um, so that's where all our docs are. It's uh, you know your go-to source for any questions you have. Um, also, as everyone here is probably aware, there's a Google group, a forum for the Content API. If you want to find it, obviously just go to Google Groups and search Content API for shopping. But the link below, uh, if if you uh, if you want to save the link, if you weren't already aware, I just put it in the slides. Uh, again. Going forward, you don't have to be worried about writing all these down because this is going to be posted to YouTube and I will eventually publish this slide deck so you can also run these test requests just like I am. Uh, but I'm going to, you know, it's, it's, it's an admin only mode right now so only I can access this slide deck if, if people saw the URL uh, before. So relevant to today's talk, some resources that you should know about are our open source client libraries. We have client libraries in Python, .NET, Java and PHP. So we have uh, solutions already made in those four languages. So so rolling your own uh, is actually a bad idea unless um, you know. And I'm sure Andrew Lamonica in this talk could talk about it. Unless you have something really complex going on, you don't need to roll your own. Uh, so specifics about these Python. Uh, it's hosted on Google Code Hosting. Code.google.com/p is is any every, anything on Google Code Hosting. Uh, so you can the the name of the library is gdata-python-client as the link shows. Um, the documentation have been generated by PyDocs, uh, and they're hosted in the same place uh, or in the same repository, uh, the same Mercurial repository that the the library is hosted at gdata-python-client.googlecode.com/hg/pydocs, and there's documentation there for every class, every module, everything uh, within that library. There are samples coming soon. I've actually just finished a really awesome document that does everything in this talk and more. And I'll be doing that for all four uh, client libraries. Um, but uh, it's being reviewed right now and should be published. Uh, PHP, uh, again, open source, again, on Google Code Hosting. Um, unlike the Python library, the Python library, GData Python client, is actually uh, used for a lot of different APIs. I've actually written with. Uh, my predecessor, Ali Afshar, a specific library in PHP specifically for the content API. And the name of that library is gshoppingcontent-php. Um, and there are, again, auto-generated 
uh, docs generated by the PHP doc tool at gshoppingcontent-php.appspot.com, documenting uh, every function, every class, etc. Uh, and there are there is example code within um, the uh, the open source project on Google code hosting. I'm not going to read this link, but if you go there, there's a tab that says source. Um, and within there, you have a, a view of the actual file system in the library. There's an examples folder. Just click that, and you'll have an example of pretty much every action you'd want to take with the API. Next is Java. There actually is already an existing document um, for implementing uh, Java. So I'll just point you to that document, developers.google.com slash shopping dash content slash developers underscore guide underscore Java. Uh, Links like that, Developer's Guide Java, uh, will, will show up soon for Python, uh, .NET, and uh, PHP. So, so it'll just be Developer's Guide Python, Developer's Guide .NET, Developer's Guide PHP. Um, in, for the, the Java doc set, the main thing being used is, is a, uh, it, it's a, it's a client library called the Google API Java Client, and that's part of actually a, a second generation of client libraries. Um, but the document really... Uh, goes into detail on that. Uh, and finally, .NET is something uh, I wasn't comfortable with when 2012 started, but I've written a lot of C-sharp since. Uh, again, Google code hosting. Uh, the library is called Google-GData. There are auto-generated docs at Google-GData.GoogleCode.com, et cetera. Please don't memorize it. Um, and there are example, there's example code at these two links. I, I, the links were way too long to actually put in here, so just goo.gl slash capital H E I six Q and goo.gl slash A capital U X A one. Um, and uh, and and th those links, the first one, the H E I, contains uh, a sample for doing operations on items, which is what we're going to talk about today, actually updating your product data. And the second one is uh, for managing multi client accounts, which I know some people in here. Uh, actually manage. Uh, others may not worry about it. If you don't worry about it, obviously you don't need to take a look at it. So the next step is uh, a review, a primer on using the API. I'm going to keep this short. These are some borrowed slides for some, for some other slide decks, but I just want to get us in the mood for talking about API requests, right? So if you're inserting a product, this is pretty much what it looks like. You have um, an atom entry uh, holding the product data. Uh, and it's, the data is formatted as XML, obviously, so it can be machine readable. And we, we have things like title, uh, which is in the Atom namespace, content, which provides a description, um, and then custom uh, ele elements from our own namespaces, namespaces specific to the content API, uh, like the ID to describe your product, uh, the condition of your product, price, etc. So once you have this, um, you post as you know, this XML payload to a specific endpoint. And this endpoint, um, you see it at the top here in the green, post HTTPS content.googleapis.com, etc. Um, and this is a specified link, which we'll talk about in, a few, in two slides, actually, uh, that you can make requests to. Uh, and the third line of this little code snippet you see um, an authorization header. You're going to need to send an authorization token, and we'll talk about how you can get that with a client library uh, and how you can abstract away uh, the, the authentication process. So if it succeeds, you get a 201 response. If, if you insert an item and it's been inserted correctly, you'll get a 201 with some various header data, uh, one of which is location. So the second to bottom row here, you see this location, content.googleapis.com blah, blah, blah. Uh, it includes uh, a dummy um, account ID for the merchant. And then at the very end, you have a unique identifier. And this is why it's called location, a unique identifier for the product. And that's what we're going to talk about on the next slide. So this unique URL for each product is actually going to be used when you make update and delete requests for the product. So it's, it's very important to keep track of, right? And this location is composed of a few big pieces to think of. So the first big piece is the root. The root is https colon slash slash content.googleapis.com slash content slash v1 for version 1. The second part, obviously your item is yours. So it has to be your merchant ID to, to be able to associate the product with your account. The next is the path. Um, so for items, the path is slash items slash products. 
But as people may know, uh, there are other um, operations that can be performed with the content API. So there are other paths. There's a managed account pa accounts path for uh, MCA operations. There's a data feeds path for data feed operations. Uh, and, and there you know, may be more paths as the content API grows. Um, the next thing is a projection. We have two, generic and schema. I'm not really going to get into that today. And then the last one, like I said, is the product ID. And that is uh, a string of four values delimited with a colon, the first of which is a channel, either online or local, the second of which is the language for the product, here it's English, the third of which is the country for the product, here U.S. for the United States, and fourth, the unique ID that you actually set in the SCID element. So here it's SKU123. And other than sending back the location and a 201 response, you're actually getting a body with uh, the same information you sent. So you have the same content language, the same title, the same content, etc. cetera. Uh, and you're getting back new things. So you have a published element. You have an edited element. You have an expiration date, which has been set uh, by the API. So, so all these things um, and more are, are returned in the API response. Um, and one last part, or actually two more things in the primer. First, batch operations. Um, I highly encourage it. We'll talk about it a lot today. Um, but batch operations, for those who don't know, allow you to put multiple products and operations in the same request. So you can delete one product and insert another product in the same exact request. Uh, not different requests for different operations, but the same request. Uh, there is a one meg cap on each request, um, but we do allow compressed requests. So you can, you can gzip or, or use some other compression method to make your uh, request smaller and hence fit more, uh, more products and more operations into the same batch request. Uh, from a batch request, it's, you don't just get one single batch response that says good job or bad job. You get individualized responses for each operation you attempt to perform, and by the same token, you get individualized errors for each, uh, for each request that errored out. Um, this is pretty helpful, especially when you put this next to using data feeds where you just have you know, sort of a, a mass email after the fact. This is, this is a great way to understand what has worked, what hasn't worked, and act on it almost instantly. Um, so finally, the great part of using batch requests is that you save on the number of requests. And this is a picture I really like to use, so please keep it in mind uh, when you're thinking about using individual requests. The great thing about batch requests is you take products and operations, you bundle them all into one request, and you just send it away with a post. Okay. Uh, and so the last thing I wanted to review is uh, special modes. So one of them is dry run mode. Dry run mode actually allows you to test out your request before you actually make real changes to your inventory. So you can, pr you can test out an insert without actually inserting the product you're testing. Um, by doing so, the responses, the errors, the warnings, everything you would expect to get back will actually be returned in that request, but nothing happened uh, in your actual inventory. The, the API receives the request, it does all the usual things it would do, and it doesn't inject the item into, uh, into our database, but it does do everything else it would do. Um, so you can enable this by simply adding uh, a, a small parameter, the dry run parameter, to the end of your query string. Like I said, it's available for any state changing operation, inserts, updates, deletes, um, and this is what it looks like. You make a post request, so here would be a post request for an insert. You have your root, you have your, uh, your account ID, you have your path, you have your projection, and then uh, the second line is just a question mark to start your query parameter, and then dry run, okay? So how, did, how, how does some of these apply to best practices? So uh, a best practices doc we actually just launched about two or three weeks ago. I highly encourage people to read it. It's on our documentation. I don't know. Uh, the link may be a little small there for people to see. I'll get it bigger for a second. There it is. Developers.google.com slash shopping content getting started best practices. Um, and there are really five best practices to keep in mind. And I'll go into detail about them uh, in the following slides. But first, don't use the API like you're using feeds. Second, don't mix feeds and the API. Third, update items as soon as they change. Fourth, 
Make sure to update items before they expire. That's actually different from as soon as they change, and we'll go into details on that. And fifth, combine updates into batch requests whenever you can. This really relates to the stuff I talked about before. So first, don't use APIs as you would feeds. Why not? Well, when you're using feeds, you send an update of your entire feed every day. If 10% of your inventory has changed, you send 100% of your inventory every day. But that's a waste. That's a waste of uh, our space, it's a waste of your space, and it's a waste of processing power. So you only need to update the items that are changing. Uh, sending your entire feed, like I said, consumes time and resources, and it's just not worth it. Rather than sending 100%, you can just send that 10% that has changed, and the other 90% won't be affected. It won't go away. Nothing bad will happen. That's the great part about the API. So the second part, don't have a whole lot on the slide. Don't mix base feeds with the content API. Don't mix base feeds with the content API. This is actually something that's been discussed on the forum, and I know one of the attendees uh, may or may not do this, but the thing about mixing the base feeds and the content API is there's a lot of undefined behavior. If you're making uh, updates on a feed and also updates with the API, there are race conditions. You know, you have two updates racing to the database, and you may think one's going to get there first, but you don't actually know. The, the, the behavior is undefined. Another issue, if you insert an item with the API, but you decide you want to delete it with a feed, you actually can't do it. So way too much undefined behavior. There's a lot of other things other than those two examples, but just don't mix them. If you're going to switch to the content API, then please switch to the content API. Don't, don't straddle the river in between. But... Uh, you know, if people have other opinions and things like that, we can discuss them uh, after after the webinar. Um, the third thing, update items as soon as they change. This obviously ensures your data on Google product search is as fresh as possible, and everyone wants that. So rather than doing four big feeds updates every day, or two, or one, or however you're doing it with feeds, or, or used to doing it with feeds, you can send an update the second the item has changed. This you know, makes things super fresh. Uh, it also keeps a log jam of requests and updates that need to be made from building up. If you send a request the second it needs to be sent, then you don't have to add it to any queue of requests, right? Uh, the fourth thing, make sure to update items before they expire. So this is a bit different uh, than the uh, update items the second they change. Uh, so by default, items expire in 30 days. This is if you don't send any expiration date with your product, it will be tacked on an expiration date 30 days in the future from your request, um, and you can't extend it beyond 30 days. That's the maximum the API allows, right? So if you don't change an item over the period, it will expire. Let's say 50% of your inventory changes all the time, and the other 50% seldom changes, you know, on the order of three or four times a year, but certainly not every 30 days. Well, that 50%, if you don't touch it after the initial... Uh, insertion of that inventory, it'll expire in 30 days, and you don't want that. You want your inventory to be around to show up in Google product search, right? So to avoid expiration, you can send, in quotes, empty updates. So empty updates would be uh, an, an update of the product without actually any changes to the product. So you can, you know, make a GET request, get all the product data from the API, and then just send it right back with an update request. Uh, except don't send the, the expiration date. You can either manually have an expiration date 30 days in the future, or you can just get rid of the expiration date element and have the API, again, by default, set an expiration date 30 days in the future. So if you did this once a month, then we would be back in the data feeds mindset, and we don't want to be there, right? So don't do it all at once. Spread the load. Uh, one one approach that I like is, you know, pick a fixed number of days, preferably something that divides 30, uh, and use that as your horizon. So let's say I, you know, all my products that expire in five days, then I'm going to update them. I'll send an empty update so they don't expire, and now I have a 30-day window. And then five days later, I'll do that for the items that expire five days from then, right? But there are other ways you can do it. Uh, really, you know, be creative. It, it has to obviously depend on... Uh, on your own data, on your own inventory, uh, and on the frequency of your own updates. But again, don't do it all at once. Spread the load. Uh, and the last best practice I want to talk about before we get super technical uh, and super Python is that hopefully this is a no-brainer, but combine 
updates into batch requests whenever you can. This gives you better performance, gives us better performance, um, and it allows you to update more items with fewer requests. Obviously, uh, it saves time, and a lot of times it can save space. Um, and another great thing that it saves is your quota. You do have a quota limit uh, on a lot of different things, and this can actually use less of your quota. I know a lot of people uh, don't have a lot of experience with this, but it actually can be relevant. Um, uh, sometimes, you know, I mentioned before the third best practice, I believe, uh, update items as soon as they change, right? Well, if you only have, let's say, one change every minute or one change every five minutes, that's fine. Just send that change. But if you're, you know, getting up to five, six, seven, eight changes a minute, it may be better to hold off and wait until you get a few piling up and then send a batch request. Um, and I'm sure there are, there are folks even uh, in this particular Hangout who have experienced similar situations. So finally, for the fourth section, using a client library to manage your product data. Now, again, like I said before, we're going to be talking specifically about, about Python. But one of the great things about Python is that it pretty much reads like pseudocode. So a lot of the things you're going to see, whether you understand Python or not, you'll be able to understand as general programming concepts, which uh, hopefully makes this visible by Python experts and non-experts alike. Uh, but if you'd like to zone out, feel free. So the first thing I'll talk about is installation. Uh, like I said, it's, it's hosted on Google Code Hosting. If you go there, you click Downloads at the very top, uh, there's a download, uh, just a zip of the entire contents of the library. So download it somewhere, unzip it somewhere in, in your directory of choice. Um, once you've unzipped it, either if you're on uh, Mac or you're on Linux, CD into that directory. If you're on Windows, DIR into that directory. Um, and run Python setup.py install. That's it. It's installed. Okay. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is authentication. Now remember, every request you send needs to be authenticated. You need to send an auth token in the header of your request. And this can kind of be a pain, but the great thing about these client libraries is they allow you to do authentication, they allow you to include your auth token uh, without worrying about any of that. They abstract away everything, so we can really just deal with the product data. That's really what we want to do. We want to deal with the product data and the way we're operating on our product data. Everything else let somebody else deal with, right? Like I said, this is, this is a, a pre-made solution, so you don't have to roll your own. So all requests to the content API obviously need to be authenticated. So here we're going to use what's called programmatic login or client login to, uh, to get a token that can be sent in the header. A token is obtained from client login just by making a post request to google.com slash accounts slash client login. Uh, and w the, the body of that request needs to have a few things. Uh, in the green at the bottom, you need to send uh, your email address, your password. You need to send the service you're authentic authenticating against. So here, the service is called structured content. And then you need to send a fourth property called source. Uh, and the source property is really just for logging purposes. It, it, it just identifies your application in some way. But it, 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 it's not really tied to anything. So you can call it whatever you want. Here we call it the Content API Webinar source. Um, so let's see some Python and actually execute a request to client login and get to get ourselves an auth token. So first, we're going to import a module. So this module, gdata.contentforshopping.client, is going to do all the work for us. So it's a, it's a, a module in the gdata library. It's specific to content for shopping. And uh, it's the client part of the content for shopping uh, module. Now, we, we're also, we're also uh, going to use a data uh, part of that. And uh, those, are, those are the two prongs that do all the work for us and abstract away all the hard part, uh, all the hard programming parts uh, that we may have to worry about. So first, we're going to set up our email, our password, and our application name, which is equivalent to the source. Email. Fake email, password, fake password, application name. They're just strings. Um, and next, we're going to instantiate a client object. So the client object is uh, going to be uh, an instance of the content for shopping client class, which comes from the gdata.contentforshopping.client module. 
so we instantiate a, cl uh, a class object, and then we use the object to make a request. Client.clientLogin is, is the method, and we're sending our email, our password, our application name, and then we also send the service that we're authenticating against. And again, like I said, the service here is structured content. Structured content is actually what the API was originally named, and that's why you see uh, SC as the, na the, the, the shorthand for the namespace as well. Anyhow, let's make the request. I'm going to click Execute Code, and it will actually make a request to client login and give me an auth token. So there it is. So there's my auth token. Uh, as you can see, it's a uh, gdata.gauth.clientLogin token object. And I'm not going to provide the whole thing. I, I, I whited out the last about 90%. But I actually have a token string on this object, which is typical for what you receive from client login. Um, so remember what your requests look like. You have all this uh, jumbled XML with various uh, attributes, some of which come from different namespaces. So uh, we're going to build this with Python, and I just wanted to, to remind you what it looks like so some of the things we do on the next slide make a bit of sense. So title and content come from the main namespace, which is Atom. Uh, whereas ID, condition, price come from namespaces specific to the content API for shop, right? So let's create a project, product. Excuse me. So first, uh, we're going to have our imports. I, I have uh, import CGI is actually commented out. There's going to be a reason for that. I'll explain it in a bit. Um, then I'm going to just import two modules. The first is atom.data. This is a general data module for all, uh, all G data APIs that are using the Atom namespace. So title and content, as well as link, are coming from this namespace. So that's why we're going to use it. And then the other one, which I mentioned before, is gdata.contentforshopping.data. This holds all the custom data classes that we used for this API. And it's a really, really long string to keep putting on every line of the slide. So I'm just aliasing it as CFS underscore data, CFS for content for shopping. So when you see CFS data, I'm really talking about the data module for the content for shopping. Okay? So we start off with a product entry, an empty product entry. Uh, and recall entry is, uh, is the name of, uh, of the uh, atom element which holds all the product data, right? So CFS data dot product entry is what we start with for our empty product. Now, first, we want to set title. So to set title, we just set the title attribute on the entry with um, one of these custom data classes from the atom.data module. Atom.data.title with a string for the title. So it's 32 gigabyte uh, MP3 player. Similarly, we set the content. Oh, my gosh, it holds so much music, 32 gigs. Um, and finally, uh, we're going to use the, uh, the link part of the atom.data names, uh, excuse me, uh, module to, to set the actual product link. So to set the product link, you're going to use a link rel equals alternate link. And here we can use Python keyword arguments rel, type, and href to actually build this custom link uh, attribute. And instead of actually directly setting the entry.link uh, attribute, as we did with title and content, we're actually appending to a list. Because since there can be more links, there can also be rel equals edit, rel equals self, rel equals next. You know, things like that, uh, we, we only are uh, appending to a list of links rather than directly setting the link. Um, so now for the custom attributes specific to the content API for shopping, they're all pretty similar, so I'm going to go through this quickly, but the first one we directly set the product ID attribute to CFS data dot product ID, and then we just use a string for the product ID. Uh, price, very similar, uh, and, and as with the link, we actually have an XML attribute unit on the, the, the price uh, XML um, attribute, and uh, XML element, excuse me, and, uh, and so we use the Python keyword unit to actually specify that attribute. And you know, the rest uh, proceeds similarly. One last comment I wanted to make, uh, with Google product category, uh, you have these greater than signs to go to a more specific category, a more specific category, and some of these have ampersands. So typically, when you send XML that has a greater than sign, you need to XML escape it. So instead of greater than sign, you use ampersand gt colon. Similarly, ampersand, ampersand 
needs to be escaped as ampersand AMP colon. In Python, you would do that with CGI.escape. You just put the string in there and it escapes it for XML. However, you just need to worry about data here. You don't need to do any of that because the client library does all that for you. It escapes it into everything it should be escaped for, and you just worry about, like I said, the data. Okay, so that might have been a bit of a whirlwind. There are a lot of attributes. That's one of the most confusing things about the Content API for shopping, so there is documentation for it. I'm, I'm not going to read this link at the bottom, but this is a snapshot of the, the auto-generated PyDocs. Everything is in there, every class, every attribute, the way to use them, it's all there. Um, so if you're curious, go take a look. We have similar stuff um, for the other, the other languages as well, as I showed in the resources section. So now let's actually do something with this client object that we've authenticated with, right? So we're going to retrieve all of our items first. The reason I'm doing this before I'm inserting a product, after I've just showed you how to make a product, is to show you that I don't have any items at all in my account. So to retrieve your list of items, recall, you just make a get request to the items feed. So it has the root URI, your account ID, the path, which is items products, and then generic, right? So the first thing we do, we specify an account ID. My account ID is not actually 1234567, but I'm not going to expose it here for obvious reasons. Um, so it's as simple as making one call to the client. So you, you have your client object. It's, uh, we instantiated it in a few slides back. Uh, it's a content uh, for shopping client. It's a member of the content for shopping client class. Um, and all we need to send is our account ID. The reason we send our account ID is so it can actually construct the URI to make the request to. And then we send the auth token that we retrieve so it can sign the request with the auth token. So the API knows who we are so it doesn't just give anybody our products, right? And it, it's going to return a feed object. But this feed object is parsed by the API. We don't have to worry about parsing some hairy XML string. It's already done by the client library. Magic. Okay? So uh, within an atom feed element, um, the products are uh, just a list of XML entry uh, elements. So we have a product list uh, from the feed.entry attribute. Okay? And this next bit of Python code is not exactly pseudocode, but what I'm saying is if the list is not empty, then let's print uh, for every product in the list, let's print the title of the product. Otherwise, print no product. So since I have no data right now in my account, I'm expecting no products, but who knows? No products. Okay, great. So I've actually literally made a request with my auth token and my account ID to the API, had it parsed by the library, and returned uh, an empty product list. Just like that, okay? So the next thing we're going to do with the product we just created is insert an item. So to insert an item, instead of making a get request, it's a post request to the items feed. It's the exact same URL that you made a get request to, um, but this time you're going to send an XML payload with the product data. But the library does all that for you. So uh, the response also, as a refresher, will contain everything you inserted, plus any errors that occurred, uh, plus, you know, things that changed, like uh, app edited, published, things like that, right? Great. So the first thing we do, we create an empty product, then dot, dot, dot. You fill it up with whatever data you want to put in it. Um, and um, I'm using the example with the 32 gigabyte MP3 player. So just as with get products, it's a simple call with a single method on the client. Client.insert product, you have this product that you've created, this custom product class, you send your account ID to create the URI, and you send your auth token to sign the request. So let's make the request and print out the title of what we've inserted. Waiting, okay, great. So now the 32 gig MP3 player has been inserted. So I was kind of willy-nilly there and didn't worry about errors. So a quick note, we're not going to actually worry about errors in this presentation, but uh, in the documentation, uh, there are plenty uh, examples using errors. Um, but if you were uh, hoping to catch errors, um, there's a custom class uh, called gdata.client.requestError, um, and you can use a try except block to catch these errors. So first you would import gdata.client, 
you would try to insert the product as we did in the previous uh, code slide, and then you would catch uh, the error sent by this request. The client is actually going to throw a request error, and then the request error is going to be, uh, you know, a typical um, HTTP response object. It's going to have uh, the headers, it's going to have the URI, and it's going to have the body. So you can actually uh, access the error response from the exception dot body. So you're catching the request error, you're aliasing it as uh, as the variable exception, and then you can get the error response from exception dot body, the body attribute on the exception. Okay, so that's it for errors, but that's something to keep in mind. Um, so I showed you how to retrieve all your products, but how do you retrieve a specific product? So Recall that an item is retrieved, uh, or an, an item's location is based on uh, a specific product ID. So you have the root URI, your account ID, a path, a projection, and then the specific product ID, which is a colon delimited string made up of channel, language, country, and ID. So rather than make you build all that and worry about making the request, um, the library really just needs uh, product ID, country, and language. So you can also specify the channel, but uh, the majority of products are online, so if the channel is online, you don't need to worry about it, right? Uh, so to get the specific product, you make a similar request as before, but instead of, instead of sending a product object, we're sending these strings product ID, country, language, and of course, account ID, and auth token. So let's make this request. Uh, I made SKU123 the ID for my 32-gig uh, player. So let's see if we can actually retrieve it. So if, if it all goes well, we should see that it's been retrieved. Wonderful, OK? So it's that simple uh, to, to retrieve um, a specific product via the client library. So now that you've retrieved it, what if you want to update it? So with the API, you can send an update request directly to the unique URL for the product. Uh, and you just resend the product payload as XML, but you have some edits, right? So let's say we want to change the title. So I change the title to uh, 32 gig MP3 player with headphones. I obviously would probably want to change the description and maybe the price and some other things. But let's say I'm just changing the title. So once you've changed everything you want to change, call the update product method on the client and let's see what happens. I'm actually going to execute this. So we have new data in the product and the new title, 32 gigabyte MP3 player with headphones. Uh, and then finally, one last thing we're going to do on individual products before we move on to batching uh, is deletes. So let's assume uh, we have this product in hand. You make a request uh, to the same unique URL, but instead of a put request, you make a delete request to delete the item. Uh, so one thing I uh, actually forgot to mention, uh, when you're getting the product before you're updating, you can, if you want to update, you can build the product the exact same way you inserted it. However, you need the unique URL. And so if you see the arguments, product, account ID, and auth token to delete product, you don't see the unique URL anywhere. Well, under the covers, what's happening is the method is inspecting the product object, and it's finding the rel equals edit link. The rel equals edit link is actually what holds the unique URL. So if you're going to build the product from scratch before deleting or before updating, you need to include a rel equals edit link. If, if, on the other hand, you do as we did, you just retrieve it, then the API will return the rel equals edit link, and you'll be, you'll be all good. It'll be copacetic. So when you delete, you don't get a product object back. So there's no title uh, that you receive, and there, there, there isn't even a body to the response but there is a response, an HTTP code on the response and a reason for the code. So let's delete and let's hope we get a 200, which means all good on the request. So cool, so our status is 200 and our reason is okay. So our, our delete response succeeded. So one, one last thing before I go into batching uh, are these custom parameters like warnings and dry run. Uh, it's as simple as specifying a Python keyword parameter. Uh, in .NET, it's, it's similar. Uh, .NET, you're, you're setting an attribute on a query object, um, but it's, it's pretty similar to this. Um, PHP, it's also a keyword argument. I don't know off the top of my head how it's done in Java, but uh, 
it's specified in all four implementations. Uh, so you just make make your request. So whatever your operation is, insert, update, delete on the products. You send the product, the account ID, and the token. And if you want to include the dry run or warnings uh, query parameters, you just set dry run to true or warnings to true. These are, like I said, keyword parameters in Python, which default to false if they're not included. And when they're false, the parameter is not added. It's just left alone. Um, and it's that simple. OK, so on to batching. Uh, this is the last thing I'm going to talk about. If people do want to hear about uh, multi-client accounts and things like that, it is enabled within the library. I just didn't want to go on forever and ever. Um, and I'd be happy to answer questions after I'm done. Um, so. Uh, to execute a batch request, every request is going to the same URI. This URI is the root URI, uh, the account ID, the path, items, products, the projection schema, and then instead of uh, a unique ID for a product, you're just posting to batch. Uh, you can also use warnings and uh, dry run with batch, so keep that in mind. Um, but this, this does make the API not completely restful because uh, you can actually send updates and deletes and uh, other things all in the same uh, request, which is which is not really uh, how REST works. But enough of that. Uh, so so what you're going to send in a in a batch request is the same thing you received when you got all your products, um, and that is uh, an atom feed XML element, and the uh, the products in that uh, feed element are going to be a list of atom entries, um, and in order to include them in a batch uh, request, you need to actually include a batch operation. So for the inserts, batch operation type equals insert. For the deletes, batch operation type equals delete, et cetera. You get it, right? Uh, and a few other things to note. Like I said, uh, for delete and update on the individual request, you need the rel equals edit link um, for them to succeed. Well, that's true for update, uh, update request, but for delete requests, you actually need to set an atom ID element with that uh, unique URL uh, for the product. And, and actually, batch deletes, you don't need any of the other product data. You just need batch operation delete, and you need that ID. Because, you know, as, as, a, parallel to, uh, as a parallel to the, uh, to the, to the single request, you know, what are we really using? We're really using, you know, the URI. And, and the fact that we're deleting comes from uh, the HTTP verb delete. Whereas here, since we're in a batch request, we need another way to specify that verb. But we really only needed those two pieces, right? So uh, let's do a batch insert. So product one is some new product. We're going to say it's 32 gig MP3 player. Product two, some other product. It has 64 gigs. So it has some other specs, different price, different description, et cetera, right? So we throw those into a Python list product one and product two into a list. Um, and we just use that to make a request like we were doing before with single products. And wrapping them up as entries into a main uh, a, a feed element, holding all the entries, is just done under the covers by the client library. And this is essentially how it's done with all four implementations. Um, so we get a feedback by calling insert products on the client with this products list. And again, obviously, we need the account ID to construct the URI, and we need a token to sign the request. So let's make the request and print the title of everything that's been inserted, just to make sure this code works. So this is actually running this code. Great. So they've been inserted. So what if we want to update? So like I said before, uh, when, you're, when you're making updates and you're making deletes, you need the rel equals edit link. So you can either construct it yourself, or you can use client.getProduct or some other method to somehow obtain these products. So let's say we already have them. We already have everything set that we need to be set. And let's update them. So the first product, we're going to make the same edit we made in the previous slide. We're just going to add headphones to the product. Uh, and the second one, we're going to add five gigs of free music. Great. OK. From there, it's pretty much exactly like uh, the client.insert products call. You throw the products into a list, and you call update products. Um, so let's execute this and make sure it works. That took a little longer. Fantastic. So our request works. Everything is awesome uh, in, the, uh, in the Merchant Center. Your products have been completely updated. And so finally, uh, well, actually, so I want to do a, a uh, side channel check just to make sure that uh, 
the updates are actually going through. We're just going to do a quick retrieve of all my items. So we've already done this before, many slides ago. I'm not going to repeat uh, what's happening. Essentially, we call get products and we print out the list of all our products. The time we executed it before, there were no products. But let's see what's in our inventory, irrespective of an insert or update request. Here we have it, the titles we expect to have. Great. Um, and the last batch operation which you can make is a delete. Similarly, as with updates, you need to somehow obtain the products. But like I said before, you really only need to set the atom ID and the batch operation. And setting the batch operation is done under the covers by insert products, by delete products, by uh, update products. So you don't even need to worry about that. You really just need to worry about setting the atom ID. So that's what the first two lines are going to do here. So we're going to explicitly set the ID attribute on each product with an atom.data.id object that uses uh, the hyperref from the edit link of the product. Um, so product1.getEditLink, it's a, it's a method that just spits out the edit link. Uh, and then we're going to use the href string attribute uh, to actually recover the, the string uh, of, the, uh, of the unique URL describing product1. Similarly for product2, we do the exact same thing, except we're calling product2.getEditLink instead of product1. And just like with updates and inserts, we're throwing them into a list and sending it off, okay? So, again, as with the individual deletes, we don't really care about the product data, uh, but we get it, uh, but we would like to know the batch status. We want to know if we got a 200, and we want to know if, if, uh, if we didn't, what the reason is that we didn't. So, let's delete these. Awesome. 200 success on both of them. So, they were both deleted. Uh, and then finally, one last uh, retrieval of all my products to make sure nothing's in there. Da, 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 nothing in there. Okay. That's it. Thank you for uh, watching this. Thank you for coming.